All right, quick up to speed. Several weeks ago, we removed the 4L80 from the ugly truck, which is the 2000 Silverado with the turbo big block under the hood. And my objective was to replace that stock torque converter with this Circle D 3400 RPM stall speed converter to help that turbocharger get spooled up quite a bit quicker and make the driving experience of this a whole lot more fun. Now, the four most dangerous words when it comes to any DIY project are while you're in there. And while I was in the transmission, I found a few things which needed to be replaced and fixed, which basically led to a complete rebuild, swapping out several clutches and drums and gears that got trashed because one tiny Torrington roller bearing just decided it didn't want to be in one piece anymore. It shredded itself and it took out a whole bunch of stuff. So about three weeks ago, after I pulled this out, I decided let's do a complete rebuild. So on the inside of this 4L80, even though it does look a little dirty on the outside, we have all new clutches, steels, seals, thrust bearings, uh, thrust washers, a whole bunch of other stuff, and then some hydraulic modifications to increase the holding power. And then finally, the one part I wanted to install way back in the beginning of September, a Circle D 3400 RPM stall speed converter. And now we are ready to get this back attached to the 8.1 in the truck. And I think by the end of this video, I'll be able to get the trans in. We'll get the cooler mounted Whew, out of breath. And then the AN lines built. I don't think I'll have quite enough time to get this out on the road, but I will show you the cluster swap. And then I'm going to try to reprogram the mileage. I ordered a tool. Uh, I actually have a, we're, we're doing like a little promotional deal with this company. They reached out. They wanted me to review one of their scan tools. And I said, well, you know what? I'm swapping clusters. I want to reprogram the mileage, so I'll give it a shot. No idea how it works. Um, we'll get to that a little bit later on in the video because I think it might involve reburning chips, which is something I have no idea how to do. So we'll learn together. I'll show you the tool. But first, we need to get the transmission back in the truck, which means because everything is brand new, we need to check some clearances to make sure when this thing bolts up, everything plays nicely together. So the first struggle that you'll find when you're putting any torque converter any, into a transmission is you've got to make sure it's seated all the way. Now, I ran this converter before. It's a Recon 88H, and I know where this thing is fully bottomed out. And I took a measurement before, take a little straight edge right across the face right here, and I measured in between that straight edge and one of the uh, bolt pads right there. And my original measurement on the, on the Recon was, I got it right over here, uh, 1.0 inches, almost right on the nose, and 0.825 from that same straight edge to the pilot, you know, the little nose that sticks out there. The Circle D converter is fully seated, and now it's actually, um, excuse me, these bolt pads are about 60 thousandths of an inch further in, so I might have to take that up to the spacer, we'll check. But the, uh, the pilot right here, that is still the same 0.825, it's actually, it's like 0.827, so I'm like uh, two thousandths of an inch um, further in on the converter pilot with the Circle D. But um, for all intents and purposes, that is seated all the way in, so we'll get the transmission under the truck. And then I'll take some measurements on the flywheel just to kind of see um, how far the converter gets pulled ahead, because you want to keep that to, I think, it's like eighth to three sixteenths of an inch, something like that. So I'll, I'll do some more measurements while it's in the truck. But first things first, I'll always make sure the converter is fully seated in the transmission before you attempt to install it. I actually had to jack the truck up just a little bit higher than it was before, just because of how tall the transmission was. But once we get it slid underneath the truck, it's pretty simple. Just kind of lowering the truck back down here, but just raise the transmission all the way up to the bell housing. Make sure everything is kind of lined up. There's a lot of hoses, wires, clips, and things like that that you don't really want to get pinched in between the engine and the transmission. I think the one thing I had a little bit of a struggle with was the one clip that holds the fuel line brackets here. I'm just kind of trying to push it up out of the way. Uh, but once I got that clip out of the gap between the bell housing and the transmission, just kind of raised it up the rest of the way, made sure the torque converter will still spin freely. I check that periodically. And then just throw a couple of bolts in and tighten them just a little bit. So I just did my measurements and I know everything is good to go, but then as soon as I got everything measured, I realized I forgot to put the dipstick in. So I am gonna have to loosen up the transmission once again. Uh, just to get that dipstick slid into place because I'm pretty sure you can actually slide it in and get it fully engaged into the transmission with the trans all the way up. So not a huge deal. There's just four bolts holding it on. Um, whenever you do take your measurements though, uh, get the bolts like a little bit more than finger tight. You don't have to go nuts, but at least put a little ratchet on there. Just tighten them a little bit to get your measurements. And when you do measure, try to be a little bit more accurate than a tape measure. I 
tape measure will get the job done. But you know, a digital caliper like this is pretty inexpensive and it'll tell you, you know, down the thousandths of an inch basically how thick or thin something is. So using that, I did measure the free space in between the flex plate and the torque converter, which is like 219 thousandths of an inch, which is definitely on the big side. You want that gap to be somewhere around an eighth of an inch or 125 thousandths. But luckily, whenever I bought the converter from Circle D, they included two bolt packets uh, because they come in threes and they're six on the 4L81. Um, and they have three thin washers and three thick washers in each packet. And I got the other one opened up and I measured them. This guy is 120 thousandths of an inch. And I actually didn't measure the thin ones, but let's see what we got here. If I can, can that's a thick one. If I can do this one handed. Okay, so 60 thousandths for the thin and 120 for the thick. Uh, so with my free space of like 219 with the 120 washer in between the torque converter and the flex plate, that'll yield, let's see, what do we have here? 97 thousandths of an inch of pullout and the accepted range is 62.5 to 125. So we are good to go with the spacing. And if I had only remembered to put the dipstick in, I could actually move on to all the finer details of the installation. You know, the uh, clips on top that hold the fuel lines and the vent line and all that stuff. Um, so not a big deal, we'll continue on, just pull the trans back, put the dipstick in, then get everything tightened up. But please, please, if you're doing this, do not forget to measure your clearances because this stuff right here, this is probably the most important part of installing your transmission. Okay, so first things first, I gotta get the transmission actually supported in the truck. So I just kinda have some room to work around underneath here because the transmission jack that I've got here is really handy, but it takes up a ton of floor space. So we'll just get the cross member bolted in temporarily and I'll get the transmission jack, just kinda lower down and pull it out from underneath the truck. All right, next up, we're just gonna be reinstalling the drive shaft, super simple stuff here. Uh, there is some adjustment in the slip yoke, so I'll push it all the way into the transmission and pull it back just a little bit. And then also the carrier bearing, there's some slotted holes in that, so I can just kinda make sure I have adequate clearance on both ends of the drive shaft. Uh, then we'll reinstall the back half onto the yoke. All right, now we're gonna be installing the bolts into the uh, torque converter and of course we have to put those 120 thousandths inch spacers in there uh, pretty simple but because there are six of them you just kind of put one in at a time turn the torque converter so you can access the next one and then install them all uh, also i am using the loctite that was provided by circle d i think it's just standard blue loctite but um, just a little bit of dab on the end of the threads that'll kind of help everything lock into place and that way it won't back out over time and don't forget the washer Now the tool that I'm using to spin the transmission over, I picked it up from Amazon. It's just pretty much a universal flywheel holding slash turning tool. Very useful. It actually, before I took this out, I didn't have the tool. I had to just put the big breaker bar with a, like a 27 millimeter nut on the end of the crankshaft. This uh, turning tool definitely is a whole lot easier. Makes it so much quicker to do this job of tightening the torque converter bolts. Alrighty, so I have the transmission basically reinstalled and I did skip over a lot of the steps because it's just simple R&R work, you know, plugging stuff back in, hooking the drive shaft back up, getting the shifter cable put back on, all simple, you know, basically put it back the way you found it. It's not that hard at all. Uh, I did want to talk real quick about the cross member that you saw me put in. Uh, whenever I modified the truck to go from a 4L60 to a 4L80, you have to change the cross member because the rear mount on a 4L80 sits a lot further towards the back by about like six inches maybe, totally not sure on the measurement, but this is what I was running before. It's a modified stock cross member. I basically just cut it and moved the center piece towards the back and reinforced it. Um, now this works great, but it is ridiculously heavy and it makes it kind of difficult to get that four inch exhaust in and out of the truck. It's doable, but I wanted something a little bit lighter and they had a little bit more clearance to offer. So the cross member you saw me install, I picked up from eBay and it's a pretty good deal. It was like 80 bucks, I think, maybe 90 by the time it shipped to the house. It's powder coated, it looks great. But there's one thing I can't stand about it and I'm actually gonna be fixing it later on this winter when I do a bunch of other chassis work. And the thing I can't stand is it doesn't have a through bolt on the end of the cross member. So on the stock one, you can kind of see each of those bolt holes right there. There's a metal sleeve that basically just kind of goes right through the middle. 
and it helps prevent the thing from kind of squishing together when you tighten up the bolt. Now the aftermarket one did not have it and I can't stand that, but uh, this is just temporary because a little bit later on this winter when I do the 547 build, I'll have the whole drivetrain out. And at that point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the cross member for the carrier bearing. I need to adjust that. You saw I had some spacers in there to get the driveline angle close. It's not perfect, so I'm gonna modify that cross member. We're gonna do some big changes to the rear suspension. We're gonna go a lot lower. We're gonna change the design up a little bit. Um, and I also need to build a cross member that goes underneath the engine because whenever I did the 8.1 swap, well, the bigger oil pan kind of interfered with the stock cross member that was under the 5.3. So I'll have to build a cross member for there as well. So we'll just kind of do a few things to reinforce the chassis, to tie everything together nice and tight. And yes, eventually I'm probably gonna have to do a roll cage and some stuff on the inside, you know, safety stuff, because of we're gonna be making a lot more horsepower and going a lot faster. Um, anyway, back to the transmission though, we're about ready to fire this thing up. And I do need to get a transmission cooler connected first. I'm not using the original one. Uh, so far with the 4L80, I've been using just the stock transmission cooler, the one in the radiator and the little itty bitty one up front. Although that does get a little warm, the trans normally ran about 195 degrees, so we wanna keep it cooler, especially considering that the higher stall speed converter is gonna generate a lot more heat. So we're gonna be installing this guy. It's a True Cool 40K transmission cooler. This is kinda of like the go-to one uh, whenever you're doing any sort of a performance automatic. So um, it's pretty simple to install, but I need to get the front end of the truck tore apart and remove the intercooler so we can build a bracket to mount the trans cooler. So this is like one of my favorite generation of Chevy trucks to work on. And part of the reason is just because of how easy everything is to remove and to add. Like the brand new trucks, everything is a complete pain in the butt, but these, you know, 99 to 02 trucks, even the 03 to 07s, super simple. And I think it takes me only like five minutes to get the entire front end stripped off the truck. I mean, there's just a couple of clips that hold the grill on, a couple of little like eight turn fasteners. And I think there's a total of like six bolts that hold the bumper on. And once you zip those off, they're all at 15 millimeters. You can just easily lift the bumper out of the way and have access to the intercooler. Now, when I installed the intercooler, I did have to do quite a bit of trimming to make it fit because even though these 99 to 02 trucks are easy to work on, there is not a lot of space behind the grill. Um, if you remember, I did have to give up my AC. That was actually mainly because of the way that I designed the exhaust manifold. But once the intercooler is out of the way, I'll be able to mount the new transmission cooler behind the A-frame. Now, if I did still have AC on the truck, though, that's the same space that the AC condenser would occupy. So I wouldn't be able to do this, I don't think, if I had the AC still functional on the truck. Just there's not enough space for the condenser, the trans cooler, and an intercooler unless I, I mean, I'd have to mount it remotely, maybe underneath the frame or something like that. Um, here I'm pulling off the original trans cooler. It's kind of funny to see how small this thing is. Now it did, I did use my scan tool, I used HP tuners to kind of keep an eye on the trans temp and about 195, 198 degrees is kind of what this thing would max out at, which is not, it's warmer than you want, it's not the end of the world, but we're definitely going to try to keep things a whole lot cooler. So now that we have the new transmission cooler just kind of slid back into place, I'm going to use some wooden 2x4s just to kind of space it up. And really here I'm just kind of eyeballing it to see where I want it. Um, I kind of went back and forth because I was half tempted to also install an engine oil cooler at the same time. But I just, with the 40k trans cooler, just the shape of it, it doesn't allow me quite enough room to easily mount two oil coolers, you know, one for the transmission and one for the engine. So once I have my spacing finalized, I'm just cutting some one inch uh, steel, putting a couple holes in the end, and this is a very simple bracket. Um, there are some off the shelf options you can use to mount a 40k true cool in a silver auto, but those do mount it in front of the A-frame where the intercooler is, so that won't work for me. But this is pretty simple, just a couple of holes in the little bracket in the little bracket right there. Use some quarter inch bolts to attach it to the true cool right there. The true cool did have those little 90 degree L brackets on the front. And to attach it to the A-frame, I just get another short section of one inch strap. I'm just going to make a mark for a little hole in there and we'll cut it to length and we will drill the hole. Now you will notice I'm going to be using the TIG welder here to kind of hold everything together, which 
you know, welding is welding. You can use a MIG, you could use a stick welder, you could use, you know, whatever you want. A TIG welder definitely does take a little bit more time. And it's definitely not required to do this sort of a job, but I just, I don't know, I like using the TIG welder on stuff. And the other good thing about using a TIG welder in a situation like this is you've got a lot of, you know, fairly thin aluminum between the trans cooler, the radiator, um, right in this small space here. So if you used a MIG welder, a lot of that slag could potentially kind of spark up and melt into the trans cooler or the radiator. But a TIG welder, it's a much cleaner uh, welding process, so there's no slag that's gonna bounce off and hit anything. Although you do need to be careful about how much heat you put into this part because there is still quite a bit of heat radiating away from the welding. So I did the finished welding pass on the bench and then once I got it painted up, we can easily reinstall it into the truck. So to attach my new upper bracket to the A-frame, um, right now I'm just going to be using these self-tapping sheet metal screws. I think in the future what I want to do is get one of those little uh, nut insert type tools so I can actually, instead of using a self-tapping screw, I can use like a threaded insert in there. Uh, I don't have one yet, but I think when I kind of tear the truck back apart next time, I'll definitely get one of those nut insert tools and it'll just make it a little bit easier and a little bit stronger to mount stuff like this into thin metal like that aluminum A-frame. A little bit of paint just kind of helps make it look nicer and prevent corrosion and then this one will bolt right on the bottom the same way as the top, giving a nice permanent mounting spot for the True Tools 40K transmission cooler. Okay, so the trans cooler is mounted and we're ready to start building some lines and after that we can actually fire this thing up. Um, if you're going to connect your true cool to your stock transmission cooler lines, it is doable. You will have to bend them a little bit. They're made from aluminum. It could be a little bit of a trick. I'm just eliminating them altogether. I don't like the stock hard lines and they've been modified quite a few times already. I know first for the 4L80 because the rear fitting is longer than the 4L60 and then when I put the wider radiator in I had to bend the lines a little bit there and then finally when I relocated my stock trans cooler from in front of the A-frame to behind it uh, to fit the intercooler I had to uh, bend the lines once again so I just I don't like the stock hard lines to begin with they've been all bent up so we're just getting rid of them and we're going with some Dash 6 uh, stainless steel braided AN line um, to me it's a much cleaner job you will need a few adapters to make that work with a true cool and a 4L80. Um, this is the part number for the, uh, let's see, this is for the fitting on the bottom of the true cool right there. It's a 5 8 inverted flare. Uh, so that's the fitting that adapts to a dash six. That's the hose end right there, but um, you can kind of see it maybe right down there. Anyway, uh, you'll need two of these and then you'll need two uh, dash six and fittings for the 4L80. And if you have a rear feed, you will need this fitting. They'll come in a pair. There's one short and one long. If you have a 4L60, you get two of these, but if you put a short one in the rear port on a 4L80, you will burn it up because this is what provides lubrication into the center support and it lubes basically most of the gear train. So anyway, if you're doing AN lines on a 4L80, make sure you get the correct fitting. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about real quick is the transmission cooler that's in the radiator. We're going to just get rid of it all together, although I do know there are kind of mixed opinions on that about whether or not it's a good idea. But basically, here's kind of how it works. Fluid comes from the transmission. It first passes through this heat exchanger that's actually inside the tank of the radiator. I got this line on here now just to kind of help rinse it out so it doesn't drip ATF forever. But um, it passes through this heat exchanger where it comes in contact with the water that's on this side of the radiator. Now, um, on the radiator side of things, the hot water comes out of the engine over here. There's a thermostat and then it gets passed through this radiator. And by the time it gets over here, the water is probably, uh, it kind of depends on your thermostat. It depends on how efficient the radiator is and how hot the day is and things like that. But let's say for conversation's sake, the temperature of the water on the cold side of the radiator is 170 degrees. Well, what that means is if your transmission fluid from the transmission is actually colder than that, the fluid is first going to get heated up and then it gets passed up front here to get cooled off to whatever temperature it gets cooled off to. Now, that's how the factory routes it and you could, and I have seen a lot of guys run a true cool in that same exact fashion. And the thought is, well, if it's winter time, it'll help the fluid warm up a little bit because they say you don't want your transmission to run too cold. Personally, I'm never going to be driving this truck in the winter. It's not a daily driver. And 
To me, if I'm running trans temps that are like 130, 140 degrees, I am perfectly okay with that because remember, we got a lot of horsepower and we got a loose converter and both of those things make a lot of heat. So anyway, um, take that for what you will. The True Cool kit does come with a little thermostat, but uh, I just honestly don't love the idea of putting a thermostat, just another valve in the line, because if that gets plugged up or if it fails, you're not gonna get lubrication into the rear of the transmission and it could cause it to burn up. So I would much rather have uh, maybe slightly colder fluid than I would have a plugged up thermostat. I'm not saying that they're prone to failure, I don't know. To me, it's just peace of mind to not have it in there. And not only that, there's no good way to adapt this to like a Dash 6 AN. So we're just gonna go straight from the transmission to the cooler and straight back in again. And that's how we're gonna run it. So I'll build a few lines, then we'll fire it up. So when you're working with a braided steel line like we're doing here, the one thing I always like to do is wrap the end where you're gonna be cutting with some sort of a tape. It could be masking tape. Here I'm using electrical tape. But basically you just want to prevent the ends of the steel from kind of fraying apart as you make the cut. Now this is actual Earl's line right here. This is pretty good stuff and it cuts a lot nicer than some of the stuff I've used from Amazon in the past. You know, some of the less expensive hoses, whenever you go to make the cut, the ends will just flare out like crazy. Where this Earl stuff, you can make the cut and for the most part the steel braids stay intact, which makes it a lot easier to install the hose nut on the end of the hose so we can install the fitting. So like as once I got my protective sleeve on there, just gonna pull off the tape. And this is where this Earl's hose assembles so much easier, just kinda spin the nut on. You don't have to fight with those flared out stainless little fibers on the end. Also a trick that I found that makes life a little bit easier, just take a little socket and just kinda spin the hose nut on there. And also it is left hand thread on the hose nut and right hand thread on the fitting. I always keep the hose nut stationary in a vise or something and then spin the hose end into the hose nut. That's provided the best results for me. I know some people try to spin the hose nut, but I think that's backwards. So I've got the first line basically built. This is pretty simple stuff. You just cut it to length, take some measurements, put the hose ends on, and I am just making sure I keep the hoses out of the intercooler's path because the intercooler does take up just about all the free space on the front end of this thing. but by routing the hoses kind of off to the passenger side. I've got plenty of room. Once again, a ratchet and a socket makes it really, really easy to get the hose end on, and you do have to spin it backwards from traditional threads to install the hose end onto the hose. I also like to use a little bit of, this is lubricant specifically for AN hose fittings, but anything like WD-40 or ATF will work, and it just makes your life a little bit easier when you're threading the hose ends into the hose nuts. Now this stuff here is pretty cool. This is fire tape, I think they call it. It comes with a fire sleeve and it just makes a nice little way to seal and kind of dress up the ends of the little protective sleeve. Now this tape is really odd and cool because it doesn't stick to anything except itself. Uh, but once it does stick to itself, it's pretty much permanent. I've tried a little bit to like, see if I could try to take it apart and it's not going anywhere. So this fire tape is really nice to dress up the ends. Although sadly I didn't have enough to do the two little short sections on the front here. Uh, just the main section down below the transmission. Drilling for a couple of cushion clamps to hold the one longer line and just make sure you use like a wooden block or something behind where you're drilling so your drill bit doesn't poke into the radiator because that would pretty much ruin your bit. Cushion clamps, they just kind of help keep the lines out of the way and once we get a little bit of fluid in this truck, it's time to do a test fire.
All right, guys, I started it up. I put all the fluid in that I had, which was only like nine quarts, and it is a little bit low on the dipstick. In fact, it doesn't even really reach the bottom of the dipstick, but uh, started the truck up, put it in gear. It shifted through the forward gears and the wheels even turned backwards when I shifted into reverse. So I I'm not gonna like say it's a success just yet, but I think the transmission rebuild, I think it's all gonna be just fine. But we need to button up the truck and actually take it for a test drive to verify that. But anyway, we're moving in the right direction and I'm really excited. So it's just like one major milestone checked off. My first major transmission overhaul. Hopefully, hopefully it goes just fine on our test drive. Anyway, um, the trans cooler install, that's pretty much buttoned up right now. We don't have any leaks anywhere to speak of. I put a lot of this uh, DEI uh, for fire sleeve, I think they call it. Up here, it's just to kind of protect from any sort of chafing. And then down below, it's where the two lines run right next to the crossover pipe and then the down pipe. There's a lot of exhaust heat right there, so that'll help keep the heat out of the trans cooler lines. Uh, that's pretty much all I got to say right now. I'm just, I'm, my mind's going in a million different directions. I'm just really, really relieved though that at least the transmission seems to be doing what it should. So. Uh, that'll bring this video to an end and I got to say thank you for watching. I honestly appreciate it guys. I really do because without you watching, I wouldn't be able to do what I do here, which is just have fun and build cool trucks. So thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Um, I'll catch you next time guys. We're going for a test drive.